I am so appreciative to be here. I never take an opportunity to come and spend time with my Teen Challenge family lightly. Uh, I was telling Executive Director Brown, he was telling me about, oh, it's an honor. No, brother, it's an honor for me every time and any time that I can come, and it's a privilege. And uh, so I'm going to take it seriously as I do any time and every time that I stand before people to speak the word of God. Uh, and I want to hear up and get out the way because I'm looking forward to Mike's message coming next. Where you at, Mike? There he is over there. I'm looking for Mike Conway's message coming next. Amen. I do have an assignment. My assignment is from Matthew chapter uh, 16. No, chapter 6, excuse me. Where is my... Let me go back to it. I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. I'm trying to put it up on, the, on my electronic device here, so bear with me just a second. Verse 10. This, oh, excuse me, verse 10. Well, let me pick up verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Verse 10 is the key. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray with me as we start. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. We give you honor and praise, one, for waking us up this morning and starting us on our ways. And secondly, that you meet and supply every need that we have. And thirdly, you've never left us nor forsaken us, nor shall you ever. But I pray now as we glean into your word that we be like the Bereans. We eagerly want your word and will examine your word to make sure that what we're told is the truth, but our heart's desire is for your word. So may I, Jamal, step beside out of any way of you delivering your word to your people for this time that you have determined. And I pray that your presence through the Holy Spirit is active and engaged in each of us and that we will respond accordingly to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This text is pretty, it's, it's a fantastic text. It's talking about the will of God being in heaven and on earth and his kingdom coming from heaven to earth. But this teaching itself begins back in chapter 5 when Jesus had just finished doing all these miracles and people were following him that he then said, let me take my leadership, let me take my disciples to a mountain and let me give them some wisdom. And, and just for a moment, God is going to give us some wisdom this afternoon. So he takes the disciples to a mountaintop, and at that moment, he begins to teach them about the will of God. He's teaching the disciples about the will of God and how God's will should be applied in various aspects of life. So he's sitting there teaching the disciples. He speaks to the disciples about the persecutions and the false accusations that they will face. He teaches the disciples and then gives them instruction that they must remain in the light. They must remain being the light in a dark world and that they extremely needed to be careful and cautious so that they do not lose their purpose. Some of you this morning, some of you today rather, need to be extremely cautious that you don't lose your light. Extremely cautious that you're able to engage the darkness. Jesus tells them to do nothing for their own purpose or nothing for the purpose of pleasing man, but that everything they do should be to please God. And knowing that in pleasing God, heaven recognizes you. So he teaches them that there's a proper way to communicate with God. One, he recognizes or they should recognize that God is holy. Hallowed be thy name. And that his name is holy. Remember, he was the one that said, when they said, well, what's your, he, my I am, I am who I am. 
His person and his name must be separated from all others. Don't merge God's name and don't merge God's person into others. Let God be separated. And I, and I forgot to tell you, the actual title of this message is The Separation. The Separation. Secondly, he taught them to understand the dynamic of us. The correct separation between God and man. That's the us. This dynamic of separation involves continuous production of all activity and any necessary changes that are needed for success for us. It is the force, this dynamic of us is the force that controls and influences our growth and influences our change and influences our interaction and influences all of our activities. Or let me say it should be. And if you engage it, it will be. Verse 10 picks up the story and helps to clarify that for us. He then, Jesus, lays out a clear separation for the disciples to understand one, they needed to distinguish between themselves and God. They needed to separate their will from God's will. You need to distinguish your will from God's will because your will will get you in trouble. God's will will get you right. Your will will cause you to stumble. God's will will cause you to walk straight. Your will will cause you to do the labors and the work of God. Your will will tell you, no, that's not the way God wants me to go. This is the separation dynamic of the us. There must be a distinguishing between your will and God's will. Secondly, the us was God and his disciples. The us is God in me. And the us is God in you. Look to your neighbor and tell him he's talking about you. <laughs> Following God's will. Watch this. Walk with me now because I, I don't have a lot, lot of time. I got to give Mike his shot. His shot. In God's, in following God's will, it will produce good that is recognized in heaven. Now, I don't want you to miss this. While following your will and my will and our will, it will produce good, but it won't get recognized in heaven. See, in heaven, the will of God is absolute, and his will must become absolute on earth. God's will must be the final authority in our lives. If not, we fail. And earth fails. We fail and earth fails. Thy kingdom come in heaven on earth as in heaven. Earth needs the kingdom of God to come upon it. And if we fail, earth fails. If it's God's will, to build a church. And if it's not authoritative in our lives, we fail, earth loses. If God's will is to oppose evil and darkness and it's not authoritative in our engagement, earth loses. If God's will to call people into ministry today, just as he did with the disciples then, and if that's rejected by us because of our will, earth loses. Yeah, I'm going to tell you already before I even get to it in my points. Earth is placed in your hands. Some of you have been playing, but earth is what at stake. God's kingdom here is what is at stake. Jesus was fully committed to the will and the authority of God himself. He in Matthew 26, 39 and 42 faced a challenge he was facing death he knew that the cross was going to take him out but what did he say 
he, he, he exposed his humanity by saying, I don't really want this to happen. But then he quickly got back into the will of God and said, but not my will, but thy will be done. See, it's not my will, but it's his will that you and I should be following. The will of God is that his kingdom is brought to earth. This means constructing a people governed by the will of God and engaging in all authority with all the authority that his will brings. God's will brings authority, brings power with it. The people have governed and constructed correctly on earth, bringing in the kingdom of God. These people will place his will above their own and even above the will of others. They will live under the kingly power, the Holy Spirit. They will live under kingly authority, the scriptures. And I mentioned earlier about the Bereans and how they were called of noble character, better than the Thessalonians. Because they eagerly heard Paul's word, but they then made sure when they got home, they double-checked it to make sure he had told them the truth. And then the dominion of God in heaven, which is total sovereignty that only God has. You see, God's will initiated on earth in the person of Jesus Christ was this, that none shall perish. We must surrender to the sovereign pleasure of God. God is independent from all creation, and all of the spiritual world surrenders themselves to his sovereignty, authority, and power. But here's the challenge that you and I face. We're made in his image, and we're given free will. This is where the separation of us and the dynamics of us collide, and all collisions are addressing his will and our will. That's not, they're not addressing anything else. Here's a practical application of that will. The will of God on earth is now in your hands and in my hands and in our hands. And I must say, may God help us. Through the disciples who successfully negotiated that separation of us and the dynamics of us, the church on earth was formed. He told them, build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Through those people, the church on earth was formed. It was shaped and it was sustained. A godly single-mindedness of separation will produce success. They committed to doing his will and not their own. In doing the will of God, they were beaten, they were arrested, they were jailed, and, and, and many of them were executed because of their separation from their will to God's will. They made a conscious act to reject their wills in favor of a full authoritative commitment to his will. Lord, help us today. Because of this, earth has been blessed from heaven. Our choices will determine whether earth continues to be blessed or if earth, earth loses if you and I choose his will, we win. If you and I choose his will, earth wins. If you and I choose his will, the church wins. Hallelujah! 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 So the question becomes, what will you choose? Whose will? Will you choose his will or your will? Another challenge I have for you today is, are you called? The disciples were called. Others were called and selected by God. Have you accepted the call of salvation? None shall perish was God's will. Have you accepted that call in its entirety? Uh, the disciples responded immediately with an affirmative of yes to the salvation. And they walked with God from that day forward. Have you made that commitment today to respond affirmatively to the salvation call? And also, are you called in the ministry on earth? And have you responded today 
to that call of ministry on earth that God would call you? What if your call is outside of your will? Oh, I know what I want to do for myself, and I know what I want to do for the kingdom, but what if God has a different decision for you? Will you say, not my will, but your will be done, God, as the disciples and Jesus did? Now, Brother Wilkerson, forgive me. I didn't know you were here, so. It was God's will that an unknown minister named David Wilkerson developed a ministry vehicle called Teen Challenge, which has brought many from darkness, hopelessness, and evil into salvation and a calling. That was not Brother Wilkerson's will. That was the will of God. But watch this. He decided to lay his will down and pick up the will of God and that God's will was supreme. Uh, what would be your choice today if God asked you to go somewhere and do something that you thought I could never do? That that's not what I'm gifted for. That's not what I'm equipped for. That's not what my talent is. And God said, but I see what I need you to do. What would your choice be? What would your will be? Who today has not accepted God's will for salvation? Who today has not accepted God's will to become a servant and a leader in his kingdom on earth? The disciples accepted immediately, began training, and engaged in service. What will you choose today? This is spiritual emphasis. What will you choose while you're here? Who today has not accepted a specific calling of God's will to become a pastor, a church planter, a teacher of the gospel, an evangelist, a missionary? A murderer named Saul immediately got saved and engaged in his training. He then planted and nurtured many churches throughout the world. Early 1960s, I remember it vividly, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous speech in Washington. It was, I have a dream speech. He brought to everyone in attendance and everyone watching on television and everyone listening by radio why he was doing what he did. And it was the brothers and sisters that he was telling it to that he told them that it was an urgency of now. An urgency of now. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you as I stand here before you right now, there's an urgency of now in America. There's an urgency of now in our cities. There's an urgency of now in our inner cities. God is calling each of us today to react and respond to his will. He says, join my team. None should perish and build my church. So what he tells you and I today to do at this very moment is to now see the urgency of now and to choose now. If salvation is what you need to choose, choose it now. There's an urgency. If a calling in the ministry is what you need to do and you've been ducking it, choose now because there's an urgency of now. Lives are at stake. The kingdom expressing itself on earth is at stake. And the only people that God, the only people and the only tools God used are people and people who have surrendered to him. Without you, the urgency won't get met. Without you, other lives won't get reached. Without you, churches won't get established. Without you, other missions projects will never be accomplished. A friend of mine told me some years ago that God was creating a new breed of pastors and teachers and 
prophets and missionaries and that they were coming out of the ranks of teen challenge. God is calling you. There's an urgency now for you. For you. Don't wait until tomorrow. What will you do today? Make your choice today. Today.